Our gospel reading this morning is the temptation of Jesus. And to understand the temptation of Jesus, we have to see how it is woven into the fabric that comes out of the Old Testament from other stories, other images. Our Old Testament reading today was of the creation of Adam and Eve and of their fall. The temptation, in one sense, is like the Garden of Eden run differently. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, a place of life and bounty and abundance. And yet the serpent tempts them to want more. And they sin and they leave the garden. They're sent out. Jesus, then, we find in the wilderness, in a wasteland, a place where life is scarce, perhaps where humanity finds itself after being expelled from the garden. And he is tempted by the devil and remains true to God. But another image, I think, that it really helps us to understand uh, in between these two, time-wise, is the people of Israel. After the exodus from Egypt, they're being delivered from slavery in Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, as Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. The, that the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before entering into the promised land. During this time of Israel in the wilderness, they failed time and again to trust God. It too was a time of testing and of temptation. And indeed, when Israel finally arrived in the promised land of Canaan, before long they forgot God who had delivered and provided for them and worshiped other gods, turned to other things. Too often we too fail to trust God when we are in the wilderness, when things are hard. Instead, like Israel in the wilderness, we curse God for not doing what we think he should. And when things are good, when we are in the promised land, when we are in Eden, we want more. We worship things other than God. We worship idols. Our deepest problem is not really our not having enough of something that we need. In Eden and in the promised land of Canaan, God's people had more than enough, and yet the problems show up in spades. When God doesn't seem or feel like an active presence in our life, when Adam and Eve thought they were alone in the garden, or when the people of Israel thought that they were left in the wilderness, instead of trusting God, instead of being grateful for what we have and depending upon God for what we need, too often, we are ingrates, and we want more. So we have these three images, Adam and Eve in the garden, Israel in the wilderness, and Jesus in the wilderness. And perhaps maybe a hint of a fourth image of the days leading up to Jesus' death on the cross. And here we see the test that is given to humanity in Adam and Eve and in the people of Israel. And Jesus is retaking the test. The test of Israel and the test of all humanity. And the key we should see to Jesus' resisting temptation is not any kind of special divine power.
power that he himself only has. These are the things the devil is wanting him to do. The key to his resistance to temptation is scripture. Jesus responds to all three temptations by responding from, in particular, the book of Deuteronomy from the Old Testament. The book of Deuteronomy is Moses' address to Israel after they had been in the wilderness for these 40 years and they're about to enter into the promised land. That's the setting for Moses addressing Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. And Jesus speaks these words again to Satan. So I think we too should learn to hear God's word here, to hear it, to remember it, and to follow it, and so to obey God. So let me go through these three temptations. The devil, seeing that Jesus was hungry, says, if you are the son of God, save yourself. Make bread. This directly foreshadows later when Jesus is dying on the cross and people are passing by mocking him saying, if you are the son of God, save yourself. And Jesus' reply comes from Deuteronomy 8.3. And the context here in Deuteronomy is talking about Israel. Moses is talking about Israel in the wilderness. Here is the full context of what Jesus quotes. In Deuteronomy it reads, He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which you, neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This passage comes from the context of where we understand that what uh, is going on here is that Israel is allowed to hunger in the wilderness. There's a purpose to it. Israel needed to be humbled, to realize that they are dependent upon God, and God feeds them. So what Jesus is saying here is that you are not just dependent upon food. You are much more deeply dependent upon God. That our hunger or our lack of what we think we immediately need can open us up to be aware of our deeper need, our deeper dependence on God. And our need and our dependence on God is deeper even than life or death. The second temptation, the devil tries to get Jesus to command angels, something that Jesus had the right, had the authority to do. And this indeed foreshadows when Jesus is arrested and Peter draws his sword and cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And Jesus says, put your sword away. If I wanted to, I could call upon 12 legions of angels. Military might is not the problem here. But the temptation, the wedge of temptation here has to do with the presumption of being God's special children, of being God's special sons, his special people. And this is something that Israel was very often guilty of, of being more concerned with their privileges and their rights as God's sons and daughters, his special people, 
than of the high calling, the high responsibility that comes with that. We too often think that if God loves us, he'll do the things that we want especially and the things we expect of him. So we start to slip to think that God is the one, because God loves us, he serves us and should do what we want him to. Jesus' reply is from Deuteronomy 6.16. The context of this reply, where it comes from, is Moses is referring to an incident in the wilderness at a place called Massa, where Israel is complaining to God, saying, we're supposed to be your special people, uh, but you won't do miracles for us. Why don't you do a miracle for us? Give us some water from this rock. Deuteronomy 6.16 then says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And the rest of the verse, Jesus quotes, says, As you did at Massa. He's saying, God is not there to do what I want, to do my bidding. God doesn't work for me. God is the Lord. We owe him everything, and he owes us nothing. Who are we to make demands of God, to put him to the test? So says the Son of God himself. The last temptation in Matthew's account is the most blatant one. The devil says, I'll give you it all. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just bow down and worship me. Worship me as God, and I'll give you all the power and dominion in the world. And Jesus' reply to this comes from a passage in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 6.13. In Deuteronomy, Moses is telling Israel about when they enter the promised land. He says, when you go into the promised land, you will find cities and homes that you did not build, crops you did not plant. When that happens, don't forget God who has given you these things. God, who has given you all the good things in your life, don't forget God and follow after the gods of the people around you, Baal and Ashtaroth. And this is exactly what they would do eventually. Moses concludes... Worship the Lord, your God, and serve only him. Jesus replies to Satan with a rebuke. He says, be gone, Satan, get away. Now, the only other time that Jesus talks like this is when Peter is trying to talk him out of going to the cross. But instead of being a political Messiah and leader, and he says, Peter, get out of my way. Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. When we are assaulted by many temptations, and we surely are, We are too often wayward Israel. We are often Adam and Eve. And in our sin, we are weak. But he is strong. He has given us his word. Let us take refuge in our Lord Jesus, who is mighty to save. And let us follow him in his way. Amen.